spirit, the kingdom of God. And then in verse 11 asks, or it says, and this is what some of you used to be. <coughs> I hate it when he starts talking about me. Um, and for those of you who are visiting today, you need to understand, I don't pick the lessons. Uh, back of the uh, prayer book is a three-year table, and each Sunday's readings are selected by a committee in New York City or something. And uh, so we just, this is what we got. And uh, if it makes you queasy, it's supposed to. It's supposed to make you push at us and uh, make us think about how are we living. But let me start in a uh, faraway place. Let me start long ago and far away. Most of us have a soft spot for fairy tales. There's just something wonderful about a fairy tale's reversal of expectations. It's just marvelous to find out that the frog is really a prince, that the ugly duckling is the one that grows into the most beautiful of swans. And in The Wizard of Oz, we get a double reversal at the end of the movie. First, the great and powerful Oz turns out to be a charlatan behind the curtain, pushing levers and switches that don't really seem to do much. But then, before the dust of that reversal of expectation settles, something mysterious happens. The humbug wizard does what was requested. He gives a medal to the cowardly lion, recognizing that he was always courageous. The scarecrow gets a degree in recognition of what we all knew right from the start, and he promises to take Dorothy home. Fairy tales do come true. It can happen to you. Um, and we want them to. These are tales of transformation. And what happens to the disciples in the Gospels is a thing called transformation. Somehow Jesus takes these Galilean fishermen and turns them into his agents through the power of the Holy Spirit and they change the world. They change the world. And that's why Jesus called them in the first place. I mean, if you're going to save the world, you have to start someplace with someone. And why not these guys? If you're going to save the world through humility, gentleness, compassion, and sacrifice, it only makes sense to begin with people who couldn't get much more humble if they tried. I mean, really, can anything good come out of Gal uh, Mississippi, uh, Galilee? Um, I, I had a friend in New Orleans uh, who worked for the Navy. And when the Navy moved uh, her department uh, to the uh, Stennis Space Center, one of her employees, when they were located on the East Coast, actually actor, asked her, are there any physicians in Mississippi? There are. Uh, each of the disciples was a frog who became a prince. A little 14-year-old Jewish girl has a name that rings throughout history because she said to God, yes, I will cooperate with your divine will. And if Mary and Peter and James and John can change the world, why can't we? Why can't we make a difference? Because you and I live in a peculiar time, a very peculiar time. The culture of the world is undergoing a phenomenal series of changes. The electronic revolution is far from over. The genetic revolution is just beginning. At the same time, we have this economic meltdown, which makes me very queasy. So where do we begin? Where do we begin in this transformation of the world? Well, first, be serious about what the world offers. There are two apparent alternatives. You can take free market capitalism, or you can take state capitalism. But there is a third choice, probably best articulated by John Paul II. It's the church. In the Western world, uh, the church is in serious decline, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. But in Africa, it's booming. But I would suggest to you that while the state of the church in North America is something like the state of past Christian, we're still working to rebuild. The church in North America may be in trouble, but we are trying to rebuild. Well, where do we begin in this rebuilding? With, you go back to the basics. You go back to, what does the text say? What does it say? How does it guide us? Well, 
I can study uh, the Bible, I can study church history to see what previous Christians did. I can work on making me better with God's help. But like Dorothy, I can also encourage my friends. I can provide them with purpose, pat them on the back and keep them going. Now one of the big differences between the church and any form of capitalism you choose is in the area of sex. Again, I did not pick this lesson this morning, but here it is. More and more, capitalism treats sex like a commodity. And I want to suggest to you that if you choose to treat it that way, it can hurt you very badly. I would choose a different course. I would uh, choose what the church encourages us uh, to do with sex. In the early church, there was a clear understanding that the pagans shared nothing but their wives. Christians, on the other hand, shared everything but their wives. Uh, William Barclay, the great biblical scholar, insists that the one new virtue that enter, entered the world with the church was chastity, and it helped to make Christianity a radical counterculture. So where, where do we begin with understanding sex in a positive way? First, it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. In the first chapter of Genesis, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Or to put it another way, go have a good time and produce lots of offspring. 